1 John chapter 5, verses 12 to 13. We're going to start a series in the, the book of 1 John. I have to say that um, several years ago, I was doing a Bible study with some men, and they were young Christians, didn't know the Bible well, and I said, um, we're going to read from 1 John, and I asked one of them to read it, and they started reading, and I said, I think you're in the Gospel of John. There's also 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John in the back of the Bible. So later when we were doing the study the same night, um, I said, turn to John. They go, now is that the real John or the other John? They're all real, but this is the letters of 1st John toward the back of your Bibles. If you start with the last book of the Bible, which is the uh, uh, Concordance, that's not actually a book, but um, if you come forward, you'll come to 1st John chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. John makes it very clear. He who has the Son, that's he who has Jesus, has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. And I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for today. We ask Your Holy Spirit to work in our hearts through Your Word. And Lord, I pray that You speak to us about our own salvation as individuals. Lord, you desire that all be saved, and you're not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. Lord, we don't have to pray if you want people to be saved. We know that's what you want. We know that's why Jesus came to this earth. So, Lord, I pray that through this passage of Scripture, each one of us would search our hearts and be certain that we have eternal life with you. And, Lord, I pray for our children, those in the nursery as well today. Bless their time. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you remember the classic movie, or you've, how many of you have seen the classic movie, The Titanic? Okay, almost everybody. Um, all I can say is we're getting old. That movie came out 1997. Some of you weren't even born then. So we're getting older, but uh, the storyline's well known. It was the year of 1912, and all of Britain was abuzz with the news of the RMS Titanic. It was the largest ship ever built. It stretched three football fields in length. That's 900 feet. Reached 11 stories high. Weighed some 46,000 tons. The Titanic was the crown jewel of Britain's white star line. Most expensive, impressive ocean liner to ever sail the seas. The largest moving object ever created. Think about it. The largest moving object ever created. The Titanic was billed as the world's eighth wonder, and she was dubbed as the unsinkable ship. But we know the story. Tragically, really all the Titanic ever did was sink. On her fateful maiden voyage, the Titanic left Southampton, England on April 12, 1912, carrying 1,312 passengers plus a crew and service staff of another 914 people headed for New York City, New York Harbor. And as she crossed the North Atlantic, the Titanic received a warning on April 14th, about 9.40 in the evening, about much heavy pack ice and a great number of large icebergs. But wireless operator Jack Phillips placed the warning underneath the paperwork, wait, and he continued sending personal messages for passengers. He ignored the warning. Five more warnings were received, and each one of those was also discarded. The last one was discarded because no one wanted to awaken the captain. Why should he be disturbed? Why deprive him of sleep? After all, no one believed that the ship could ever possibly go down. But at 11.40, after the first warning came in, two hours after, Frederick Fleet, sitting lookout in the crow's nest, spotted an iceberg 500 yards away. And he gave a call to the bridge, to the communication center. But it was too late. The Titanic struck a skyscraper-sized iceberg, and it ripped a 15-foot gash along the proud vessel's right side. That resulted in the flooding of six of the 16 watertight compartments. At 12.45 in the morning, the first lifeboat was lowered into the chilly waters. That lifeboat was half empty. Others desperately tried to seek safety, but for the vast majority, it was too late. Some jumped into the water and they attempted to swim, but they fell victim to hypothermia 
and they sank to their watery graves. Others chose to remain on board the ship, and they sought to climb to the highest point. But they also eventually drowned in the frigid Atlantic waters. A few even went back to their cabins, grabbed some valuables. They also drowned. In all, only 753 lives were spared. The few who believed and they acted upon what others initially refused to accept, namely that the ship had struck an iceberg and was sinking, the few who believed that report got into the lifeboats and they were saved. Now, having heard the frantic uh, distress call the Titanic, another nearby ship, the Carpathia, arrived on the scene in an hour. And the survivors were removed from the lifeboats, brought safely on board the Carpathia. And when news was telegraphed to New York City, thousands of people gathered outside the White Star Line awaiting the grim news. Who had been rescued and who had perished? On that fateful day, it mattered not if you had a first class, a second class, or a third class accommodation. It didn't matter if you were sailing on the starboard side or the port side of the ship. It didn't matter if you happened to be the captain of the ship or a crew member or a passenger. When they posted the report next to each name on board that ship, all that mattered was saved or lost. That tragedy in history serves as a great reminder of a far greater truth. Like the Titanic, this world is proudly sailing full speed ahead, ignoring constant warnings from God and from His Word. Already this earth has struck the iceberg of sin. That's a stark reality that some people choose to downplay, they outright reject, or they ignore. But the Bible makes it clear. It says that All we, like sheep, we've gone astray. Everyone has turned to his own way. We're all acting independent of God. That's the essence of sin. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This world, as we know it, is rapidly taking on the icy waters of God's judgment. This world is sinking, and it threatens to take down all on board. There's only one hope of escaping eternal death and eternal separation from God. That hope is to respond to God's warning now and to come to faith in Jesus Christ. God offers us salvation in His Son. But we must believe in His Son. And we must get into the only lifeboat that will save. That is faith in Jesus Christ. Now I can assure you that the greatest thing in the entire world is to be saved. And the second greatest thing is closely related. It's to be absolutely sure of your salvation. People everywhere are wrestling with the issue of their salvation. And they have questions like, am I saved? Am I truly forgiven and right with God? When I die, am I sure I'm going to go to heaven? Can I be sure? Upon what basis can I be sure? How can I know that I'm born again? If you don't like that term born again, Jesus said, unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. People desperately want to know where they stand with God. Am I saved or am I lost? So let me ask you, have you asked yourself that question lately? Am I saved or am I lost? When you're alone and you have some time to think and free to think and no distractions, does that monumental issue of where you're going to spend eternity, are you saved or lost, does that stir your heart? When you read your Bible or when you sit in church or when you attend the memorial service of a loved one, do you think about where you as an individual are going to spend eternity? Does the question ever enter your mind, am I saved or am I lost? Until this crucial issue is resolved, your life will remain unsettled. It's hard, and I say it's actually impossible to live for God today when you're uncertain about where you're going to spend your eternal tomorrow. How can you live for the Lord if you don't know where you're going? How can you have confident direction for your present when your future is still uncertain? So, does the Bible offer us any help? Can God direct your heart and mind to be absolutely sure where you stand with Him? Can you know that you have eternal life with God? The answer to all those questions is a resounding yes. 
We can most definitely know that we are heaven-bound long before we actually arrive there. We can know today that salvation in Jesus Christ is our present possession. We can be absolutely 100% positive. Again, as always, let me remind you, it's not what you or I think. It's what does the Word of God teach. Paul said that all of Scripture is God-breathed, and as such, it's profitable for, for doctrine, which is sound belief, correct teaching. In the written Word of God, it says in Hebrews 10, 22, have the full assurance of faith. And Peter, in 2 Peter 1, 10, admonishes us to be certain of our calling. Be sure that you're a child of God. Look at your life. And settle that. Am I a child of God? Make certain of that. One book in the Bible, and there were 66 books in the Bible, one of those books was written for the express purpose of addressing the assurance of our salvation. That book is the one we'll be looking at for the next several weeks. If you want to do homework, read over 1 John. It's not that long of a book. There are five chapters. John writes this brief letter, we call it sometimes an epistle, to assist us in determining whether or not we are actually a Christian. I'm not talking about being a Christian in name only. I'm not talking about being a nominal Christian. Listen to me. Anyone can take the name of Jesus Christ and identify himself or out, uh, herself outwardly with the Lord Jesus, yet inwardly not be born again, not possess eternal life. Just like anyone can go out and buy a Pittsburgh Steelers sweatshirt, a jersey, a t-shirt. You can buy a, a, a jersey with the player's number and name on the back. But guess what? When you look at the Steelers roster, your name's not there on that roster. And people can look at you and go, that's Troy Polamalu? I don't think so. That's not Ben Roethlisberger. That's not whoever on the roster. You can wear the paraphernalia around but you're not a member of the team. You can go walking around like you know Jesus and not actually have eternal life. The purpose of this book of 1 John is to help you and me determine under the guidance of the Holy Spirit whether or not we're children of God. Am I a true believer or a make-believer? Am I just a professor of Christianity or am I truly a possessor of eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ? The key verse in 1 John is 1 John 5.13. John makes it perfectly clear his reasons for writing the epistle as we know it today. One purpose, to help those who already believe to gain the certainty of their salvation. Another purpose, to expose those people that are religious but still lost and awaken them to their lost condition so that they may come to a true saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. There are several key words in 1 John 5. 13. And each of those words or phrases plays a strategic role in unlocking the door that leads us to assurance of salvation. The first key word as you look at 1 John 5, 13 is the word no. Salvation is a no-so reality, not a hope-so wishful type of thinking. God wants you to be sure of your relationship with Him. He wants you to know. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. He wants you to know that you're saved if you're a genuine believer in Jesus Christ. He wants you to know that you have eternal life. And I gave you some verses, I believe, that are highlighted for you that use the word know in 1 John. 1 John 2.3, you can read over those verses. 1 John 2.5, 1 John 2.13, 1 John 2.21, 1 John 3.2 and 3.14, 1 John 3.24, 1 John 4.13, 1 John 5.2, and 1 John 5.18 to 20. All of those verses contain the word no. Plain and simple, God wants us to know that we belong to Him. Eternal life is not some issue that He wants clouding our minds with doubt. It's something that He wants to be clear in our hearts and minds. God doesn't want you to go through life having this huge question of where you're going to spend eternity hanging over your head. He wants you to settle the matter of eternal life once and for all. Second key word as you look at verse 13 is the word right, W-R-I-T-E. With deliberate emphasis, the apostle states that the assurance of our salvation rests upon the infallible Word of God. That means the Bible is inerrant. It has no errors. It is authoritative. Our confidence about heaven 
is based solely upon what God says in His written Word, the Bible. Specifically, what God has to say in His Word about the good news, the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, too many folks want to gauge where they stand with God by their feelings. And guess what? You'll never be secure, you'll never be certain, if you base your salvation on how you feel at any given moment. Because we all have mood swings. Times when life is good, and then we have those other times when life is extremely difficult. Lots of things can impact our relationship, or our feelings about our relationship with God. The feeling part. Some of us have fragile personalities. Some of us have fickle temperaments. It can be hormonal upheaval that rocks our day. It can be a loss of sleep. We might have pressures at work or school at home. And that can all affect how we perceive our relationship with God. Our feelings. And those who opt to rely on their feelings for assurance of salvation will find themselves on a continuous emotional roller coaster ride. Today, life is good. Oh, yeah, I'm definitely a child of God. But man, I got bad news now. I don't feel like I'm a child of God. I don't feel like I'm saved anymore because something's going on in my life that's rocked my world. And now I'm struggling, feeling like I'm saved. I pity the person who attempts to live that way. Only the unchanging Word of God can be the ultimate basis for our assurance. The authority of Scripture is all that we need. It's enough. The Bible can set, uh, is sufficient to fortify our faith. It can give even the weakest believer the settled confidence of his or, his or her salvation. Listen to the words of the old hymn. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord is laid for your faith in His excellent Word. Your firm foundation is in the Bible. What more can the Lord say to you than He has said? To you who for Jesus have fled. How firm a foundation is in His Word. Third key word in 1 John 5.13 is believe. In order to have assurance, we must believe in Jesus Christ. The crucial question is this. What exactly does it mean to believe in Jesus Christ? Because you can go out there and ask people you know, do you believe in Jesus Christ? The reason you're asking them that is you want to know if they're saved, if they have salvation, if they have eternal life. You're asking, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Because you're not certain. They may be in your family. They may be at work. They may be in your neighbor. They may be your classmates, your good friends. And you're saying, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And they say yes. And then you're walking away going, I still don't know if they're saved. Why not? Because you haven't defined what it means to believe in Jesus Christ. It means this, to respond with one's entire being to Jesus Christ. With our mind, with our emotions, and our will. All three of those. With our mind, we must know the essential truths of the Gospel. That we are great sinners. Yes, we're great sinners. But the good news is Jesus Christ is an even greater Savior. And we need to place our faith in Him alone for salvation. The emotional part is this. We must be broken over our sin. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, A godly sorrow leads to repentance. And understand this. Repentance is necessary for salvation. Repentance is changing our mind about sin. It's not okay. Repentance is changing our mind about Jesus. We've been living without Him. Now we recognize, I need Him in my life. I need Him as my Savior. Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll perish. And then there's our will. With our will, we must commit ourselves unconditionally to Jesus Christ as our Savior. We need to turn to God from sin. That's what Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica. And he said, people everywhere in the region around, you're talking about you guys at Thessalonica. They're talking about how you turned to God from idols. That's the important thing. Turn to God from whatever sin it is. Sometimes people say, well, i got to get rid of all this sin in my life, and then I'm going to turn to God. Listen, you can't get rid of all this sin on your own. If you read the Bible, Romans 6, all of us are slaves to sin. We need a new master. And that master is Jesus. Saving faith, then, is the abandonment of my life to Christ who died for me. It's surrendering my life to Jesus Christ, the one who died for me. 
It's a decisive turning from sin and trusting Christ alone to save me. It's more than just intellectual assent. It's more than just emotional feelings. Salvation also involves the choice of my will, my making the decision to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. Listen, it's faith alone in Christ that saves. And it's not faith plus works, not faith plus baptism, not faith plus anything else. It's faith in Christ alone. Paul said in Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that faith is a gift of God. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now think of a man at the airport. He has his ticket in his hand. He checks in and gets his boarding pass. He walks down the ramp to get on board the plane. If you've ever flown, you realize there's the ramp and then there's the cabin. And you can be one foot in the ramp and one in the cabin. And as long as a person has one foot in the ramp and he has one foot in the cabin, he hasn't committed to getting into the cabin. But guess what? When the plane pulls out, He's got to make a choice. I'm either getting in the plane, or I'm staying on his ramp. I'm staying at the airport. Not until both feet are in the cabin does that person entrust himself to the cabin. That's how it is with faith in Christ. As long as I have one foot in Christ and one foot in my own religious efforts, I've not come all the way to trust in Jesus Christ. Not until I completely abandon all my self-efforts and my put my trust in Jesus Christ alone have I truly believed in Him for salvation. Anything else is not a faith that saves. There's a, a superficial, shallow type of faith. It doesn't save. In John 2, when Jesus turned the water into wine, it says there that many believed in Him. You know why they believed in Him? Because they saw a miracle. But it, Jesus said He didn't commit Himself to them because He knew their hearts. Oh, they believed there was something about Jesus but they weren't going to surrender control of their lives to Jesus. They weren't going to follow Him as their Lord and Master. So Jesus did not commit Himself to them. Even the devil believes, it says in James 2.19, the demons believe in God and they tremble. It's not just enough to have a head knowledge that there's a God or that Jesus died on a cross. We must appropriate that in our lives. Saving faith requires mind. That's our intellect, our understanding. It involves our emotions and our will, our choice, our own volition. So let me ask you this morning, as an individual, has there ever been that time in your life when you've come to believe, trust in Jesus Christ for salvation? Have you committed your life to Jesus Christ who died for you on the cross of Calvary? Assurance of salvation begins by establishing that you are trusting in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. There's no relying upon your own goodness, your own works, your own religious activity. It is faith in Christ alone that saves. Now, so I want to ask you, have you confessed your sin? Have you told God that you're sorry for that sin and transferred your trust from yourself to Jesus Christ to save you? Jesus said, unless a person's born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Now, I understand this. Some of you may not be able to give an exact date of your salvation. You, you can't tell the exact. Others of you can. Some of you can say, well, you know what? I was in children's church. I was in my home when I pay, prayed with my parents. I was at a camp, a church camp. I was wherever and I prayed. I was in my car and I prayed and I asked Jesus to save me. Others of you can't begin to say, I know the exact time or place. But I want to say something. If you, just because you can't give an exact time or place, does that mean you can't have assurance? You can I'll illustrate for you what I'm talking about. Two travelers are traveling from Pittsburgh to Cleveland. You know the history of those two cities. People go, why would you travel from Pittsburgh to Cleveland? Why would anybody go to Cleveland? But some of you may be from Ohio, so I don't want to offend you. But one drives by car. The other goes by plane. When the one going by car enters Ohio, he knows that because there's a big sign that says, Welcome to Ohio. There's a welcome center, usually near the border. But the one traveling by plane can only guess at the time that he crosses the state line. Because if you've ever flown, I've never seen a sign in the sky that says, Welcome to Ohio, or whatever state you're going through. 
There's no welcome center. There's no visitor center up there in the sky that you can look. Oh, we just, and I've never, I've never had a pilot say you just, and have you ever been flying ever say, hey, we just left that state to go to this one? I've never had that happen, and I've flown a lot. But both arrive safe and sound. Only one can tell you the exact time you crossed the state line. The only other one can say, well, I think it was about this time. Yet they both arrived safely at their desired destination. The same is true in salvation. Some people, as I said, like a man driving the car, they can tell you I was in children's church. I can tell you that I was in children's church where I grew up and I prayed and asked Jesus into my life. I can't tell you the date, but I can tell you where I was. The Apostle Paul was one like that. He gives his testimony. He was on the Damascus Road in Acts chapter 9, and a light shone from heaven. He met the risen Christ, and his life was changed. He was able to tell others about his saving moment as he did his missionary endeavors. Recorded several times in the book of Acts, his testimony. But others who are like the man that's flying in the plane cannot tell you the exact moment they crossed the line and they departed from being lost to entering the kingdom of God. Instead, they can say, it was about this time of year. It was about this, maybe this month of the year that I began to trust in Jesus. Are those people any less saved? No. Should their assurance be any less? No. More important than when one began to believe in Christ is whether one can say, today I am trusting in Jesus Christ for my salvation. What matters is that the person has crossed the line, left behind a life of sin, and has entered eternal life. So let me ask you today, point blank, do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior? I'm not asking when you did this, but do you at this very moment believe in Him? If so, then assurance can be yours. The fourth word or phrase in verse 13, the Son of God. Faith is no greater than its object. You could say, you could sit in some old rickety chair that's rusted through and you could say, I'm 100% convinced that it's going to hold me. And all of a sudden you could find yourself on the floor because it was an untrustworthy object. It's the object of our faith that must be trustworthy. Christ has to be the object of our faith in order for us to be saved. When he uses the name Son of God, John is declaring that Jesus came to this earth in human form. That's what it means, God incarnate. He came in human form to redeem us, to buy us out or deliver us from the sin market. To believe in Jesus' name means to trust completely in Him to save you. Now, throughout 1 John, the apostle goes to great lengths to, to teach us that salvation is only in the name of Jesus Christ. And again, again I give you verses beginning with chapter 1, verse 7. Then you go on to chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Chapter 3, verse 5, verse 8, verse 16. Chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. And chapter 5, verse 11 and 20. Go and as you read those, you'll see the name the Son of God. Salvation comes as we rest in the finished work of Christ on the cross. Remember when Jesus was on the cross, John 19, 30, He cried out, Telestai, which literally means it is finished. What's finished? The plan of salvation. The price of our salvation has been paid. Jesus took on His body our sins. He shed His blood as a covering for our sin. Only as we understand that Jesus accomplished what is necessary for forgiveness of our sin, only then can we have confidence in our salvation. If we wrongfully assume that we have to do good works to maintain our right standing before God, then we'll never have assurance. Turn, if you will, to the Gospel of Mark chapter 4. And I want to read just verse 35, but many of you know the story. Mark 4, 35. Uh, two of you turned, thank you. The rest of you checked out a long time ago, I guess. But flip some pages and make me think you're turning there. Mark 4, 35. Jesus said this. Let, he said to the disciples, let's get in the boat and go to the other side. He made two promises in that verse. One, he was going to go with them. Let us get into the boat. He didn't promise them, guys, when you get in there, it's going to be smooth sailing. But he did promise, I'm going with you. You're not going to go alone. Then he said, we're going where? To the other side of the lake, the Sea of Galilee. We're getting to the other side. He said, you're going to get there safely. It might be a little choppy, the road, the ride might be a little bumpy but I'm going with you and we're going to get there safely. I think that's a good illustration of what Jesus promises us, promises us when He gives the words of uh, John 10, 28, 29. He said, 
I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. And no man can pluck them out of My hand. And My Father is greater than Me. No man can pluck them out of My Father's hand. Jesus said, Put your complete trust in Me for your salvation, and I will give you eternal life. I will take you to heaven. The road may be bumpy at times, but know that I'm going with you, and you will make it to the other side, which is heaven for us. Now, if you read on in Mark 4, it says that a storm came up, and it was a violent storm, and the disciples were afraid they were going to die. They had to go wake up Jesus, and He spoke to the winds and the waves and said, Peace, be still, and they ceased. The sea grew calm. And Jesus said, you have little faith. Jesus, life is like that. If you look at that story, there were other ships on the sea. That tells us it was a day that seemed conducive to sailing. I don't think they got up there and said, look at the sky. It's a mess. Let's go out and let's have a little fun. See how scared we get. And remember, these guys were veteran fishermen. So it was a fierce storm. Life is like that. You can be having a perfectly good time in your life, and all of a sudden, things change. Doctor's report, pink slip at work, some family issue, some news about your child, whatever it is, you know, change is just like that. But here's the reality. If you gave your life to Jesus Christ for salvation, He's walking with you. And you're going to make it to the other side to heaven. And it will be worth it all. Keep this in mind. It's Christ who saves us in the first place. It's Christ that keeps us safe. The final phrase, that you may know that you have eternal life. What is eternal life? Essentially, eternal life is receiving a person, Jesus Christ. It's Christ Himself coming to live within us and giving us the very life that He possesses. Jesus, in His prayer to His Father, said that they may have eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know You, the one true God, and Your Son. Eternal life is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to understand that eternal life doesn't refer to any length of time. Because if you read the Bible, you'll discover this. Everyone is going to live forever. You're going to live forever. It's the quality of that eternal life. As you read the Bible, you're going to spend eternity either in heaven or in hell in the lake of fire. Matthew 25 talks about the eternal fire, the eternal torment. Revelation 20, 11 to 15 talks about Satan thrown into the lake of fire where he's tormented day and night. So eternal life doesn't refer so much as a duration of life. There used to be a, an old chorus people used to sing, anyone here want to live forever, say I do. You're going to live forever somewhere. It's a matter of where. Eternal life, as I said, refers to the quality of life. Eternal life is Christ living in us, and He radically and forever changes us. He takes up permanent residency in our lives once we open the door to our heart and our life and we invite Him in. Here's the reality. Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man hears my voice and he opens the door, I will come in and I will share with him and he with me. He knocks at your heart's door. You have to open the door. You have to invite Him in. He wants us, Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. He came to give you a full life, a joyful life. That doesn't mean you'll be exempt of trials, but He wants you to have an abundant, a fulfilling life. And when Christ really enters your life, you're radically changed. Listen to me. If you say I'm a Christian, then there's no way that we'll continue to walk down that same old path after we get eternal life. I think it's impossible for a true believer to remain completely unchanged. I get it that the change may be slow, and it may be at different rates for each believer, but if you were truly saved, there should be some noticeable change in your life and in my life. And the way we talk and what we think and what we do, there should be evidence to others they're changing. What's going on? George Lohr was in his mid-70s when he got saved, and I did one of his daughter's weddings. His another son-in-law said, I don't know what got into Pops, but he's a changed man. That's because Jesus Christ changes us. So what are changes we're talking about? The book of John, 1 John, records the clear evidences of eternal life. 
Remember this, it's not a salvation works, but it's a salvation that works. Eternal life begins the moment we first believe. We pass from death into life. John said, he who has a son has life. So if you know Jesus, your eternal life's already begun. It'll never end. Now, if we could lose our salvation, then it wouldn't be eternal life. You couldn't know it. I remember my old church, first church I was pastoring, one of the first times I gave a public invitation, a lady came down the aisle and said, I want to get saved again. Read the Bible. You must be born again. Not again and again and again. It's a one time I gave my life to Jesus. He saved me. He keeps me saved. I can never lose that salvation. And then He wants to change us. Now say, I've talked to people say, I used to be a Christian. I used to be saved. I was saved for 10 years. Well, then Jesus gave you how many year life? 10 year life. Is that what He said? He said, I give you eternal life. And nobody can pluck them out of my hand or my Father's hand. So, vital signs of salvation as we close. You go to the ER, you're in a bad place, you, you're in the ER. A doctor or nurse comes in and checks the vital signs of a patient, makes sure there's life. What are some of those vital signs? They take the pulse, your heart rate, your blood pressure. You, they, if you're not conscious, they might try to see if you're breathing, watch to see if you're breathing. They may shine lights in your eyes to see if your eyes are alert. A response to pain, if you're not responding, they may pinch you to see if you respond. All those things reveal to a doctor that the patient has life. If those signs don't exist, there's just one conclusion to reach. The patient's dead. How can you know if you have eternal life? There are vital signs that you can examine in your own life. If you, if you look at these vital signs and you receive a positive reading, you can know that you have eternal life pulsating through your soul. But if you say, my life is void of all nine of these vital signs, that's a cause for you to concern yourself about, am I really saved? In the next week, weeks, we'll address those nine vital signs from 1 John for you to do a spiritual exam. What are they as we close? You can see them. Communion, fellowship, sharing with Jesus Christ. Confession of your sin and awareness and a confession of your sin. Because you're still going to sin and I'm still going to sin even though I'm a believer. But now I'm aware of it because the Holy Spirit lives in me. And He says, Dave, you didn't treat your wife right. Dave, that thought was impure. Dave, those words you said weren't pleasing. They were sinful. And you'll agree with God about that and confess them. There'll be a commitment to God's Word, a compassion for believers, a change of affection and love and heart, a comprehension of the truth. You'll begin to understand the truth of the Scriptures. There'll be a conformity. You'll become more like Jesus. There'll be conflict with the world. The world will look at you and go, I don't get you, man. What are you about? Why are you acting that way? Why can't you do that? Why don't you want to do that? Why don't you say that? Why don't you talk? Why don't you listen to that? Why don't you think the way the rest of us do that? Conflict with the world. And finally, confidence in prayer, knowing that if we pray with a pure heart and pray according to God's will, that He hears us. We talked about prayer last week. All nine of those vital signs should be evident to some degree in the life of every child of God. Let's pray. So our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. I want to ask you, can you say, yes, Pastor, I am sure... I'm trusting in Jesus Christ for my salvation. I have no doubt about that. He is my Savior. He's my Lord. I know that. If you can say that, then thank God. Thank Him and say, Lord, thank You that I am Your child. Thank You for that assurance. We sang blessed assurance. Jesus is mine all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior. You can praise Him. Maybe you're here and you say, I'm not sure. Or you know what? I'm sure that... As of today, I've not yet put my faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. I know about Him, but I've also been depending on religious activity and my own goodness, my own works to get me to heaven. I realize that that's not going to cut it. It's faith in Jesus alone. If you'd like to ask Jesus to be your Savior, I encourage you to pray a prayer similar to this in the quietness of your own heart. Dear Lord Jesus, today, Lord, I, I admit and I agree that I'm a sinner. And I'm sorry for my sin. And I know that you went to the cross of Calvary. You suffered and you bled and you died. You gave your life for my sin. I'm sorry for my sin. Would you please forgive me? Would you cleanse me? And Jesus, I know you're knocking at my heart, my life. I'm asking you to come in to be my Savior. And I know that you want me to follow you as ruler of my life from this moment on. Thank you for saving me.
As our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. If you prayed that prayer today, I just ask you to slip your hand. I'm not going to point you out in any fashion. You say, Pastor, I prayed. I asked Jesus into my life today. Perhaps there are those that say, I need to do some self-examination in, in the days ahead as we work through 1 John. Looking for the vital signs in my own life, the spiritual vital signs. Would you pray for me that I, I would allow the Spirit of God to do that in my life? Yes, are there any others? I need to be willing to do that. Father, I thank you that you want a relationship with us. We don't have to wonder if we pray you welcome us because Jesus said, the one that comes to me, I'll never turn away. If we come to you, we have eternal life. Father, I pray that we each one have received that eternal life, that gift, by inviting Jesus Christ into our lives as our Savior. Lord, if there are some wrestling, I pray that they don't let the day end without praying that prayer. And they can pray it wherever, in their house, in their car. They can pray that at work, at school. They can ask Jesus to be their Savior anywhere, and you'll hear and you'll save them. Lord, I pray that we search our hearts and allow your Spirit to show us if we have all of those nine vital signs. Lord, may we examine ourselves and see our God story. When we were saved, uh, what period of time in our life, and how our life is different since we came to Jesus, because you do make a difference once we put our faith in you. Lord, I ask you to dismiss us with your blessing. Just have your perfect will and way in each one of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great afternoon. God bless you.